Hey, hey, it's me, Jerko the Clown. Welcome to the Clown Show. Monday, October 31st. The YouTube platform is crowded for the holiday. I'm talking about a movie that came out seven months ago, and everyone else is talking about Black Adam. But I don't know who that is. Hidden in the chaos, the trolls and the sex bots are waiting to strike. But I'm there too, watching, waiting. Two years of uploads have turned me into a nocturnal animal. They think I'm hiding in the algorithm, but I am the algorithm. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about the Batman. So let's talk about the Batman. He's had a ton of movies, Batman. Batman, Batman, Batman Begins, Batman Returns, Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, The Dark Knight, the Dark Knight Rises, Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Now, I love Batman. He completes me. I've got a Batman blow up doll in my closet, wanna see? But there have already been so many Batman movies, how could anyone be excited about another one? Batman is a billionaire who fights criminals in the streets. How can anybody relate to this character? Billionaires don't fight crime. They just wanna look cool on social media. So they buy social media. Everything in the trailer for the Batman was something I had seen before. I am vengeance. I am the night. Will they, won't they with Catwoman. Batmobile chase scene. Big explosion. At least the Batmobile is a cool looking car this time. It's a muscle car with a jet engine attached to the back. They even built an electric version of it. It's way better than that clunky tank from the Nolan films and the Arkham Knight game. Stupid tank missions days of my life. Everything about the Batman has been done before across Batman media, from the comics to the animated series to the games. When the film was released, all of the media buzz said that this is a darker, grittier take on Batman, and I thought, wait, wasn't Zack Snyder's take on DC dark and gritty? And wasn't Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy dark and gritty? And wasn't Tim Burton's Batman 89 originally considered dark in comparison to the 1966 film? Only the 66 film and Joel Schumacher's films are light-hearted, campy, and comedic. Why so serious, Batman franchise? The Batman is not a Batman movie for kids. It's a Batman movie for me. I had him first. He's mine. So is the Batman the best Batman movie? Is Robert Pattinson's Batman the best Batman? Did you sign your Robert Pattinson apology form? Come along with me for a dance with the devil in the pale moonlight. It's the Jerko the Clown, The Batman 2022 Halloween Special. The Batman has the appeal of a classic blockbuster film. It incorporates many different genres to reach the largest amount of viewers possible. It has drama, mystery, action, romance, comedy. Just kidding, there's not really anything humorous going on here. The only thing that might be kind of funny is how emotionally disconnected Batman is. Some drive. Jim Gordon and Batman have a very dry procedural back and forth exchange of dialogue as they're solving clues and following leads. The Batman weaves different genres together but maintains a consistently grim and serious tone. The pacing is glacial. The Batman sets up Jim Gordon, Selina Kyle, the Riddler, the Penguin, Carmine Falcone, Alfred Pennyworth, and of course, Batman and Bruce Wayne. No wonder this movie is three hours long. That's a lot of characters to develop. The supporting cast are excellent. There's not a role that stands out as being underutilized. The main plot is that Batman has been called in by Jim Gordon to solve the case of a serial killer. This leads Batman into subplots involving Selina Kyle and her missing friend, the sex worker Annika as well as the introduction of Gotham's crime lords with Penguin and Falcone. There's a running theme of creatures with wings. 
one of the clues that Batman is following is something about a rat with wings. So it could be Penguin, it could be Falcone, it could be Batman. This means that after the Penguin Falcone thread sees its conclusion, there's still another act of the film to wrap up Riddler. This is a long movie. It's your whole afternoon. And don't watch it in the afternoon because it's shot so dark that you'll have to black out all of your windows to see what's going on. Nearly every scene is at night or in the rain. This works well because Batman is in his suit for most of the movie. The heavy shadows mean that the superhero costume doesn't look as silly as it does in other live-action adaptations. The look for Catwoman, Penguin, and Riddler are all more grounded interpretations of the characters. Catwoman's cat ears are subtle. Riddler is a guy wearing cling wrap around his face. Colin Farrell's Penguin is probably the most exaggerated performance in the movie. He's portrayed kind of like an over-the-top Scorsese character. Look at you two! World's greatest detectives! Am I the only one here knows the difference between Al and Law? The Batman is not a traditional superhero movie. There aren't a ton of action scenes. Sure, Bruce Wayne rides down some stairs on a motorcycle like he's Cloud from FF7, but the Batman is not overly concerned with extended action sequences. The fight scenes in the film are quick and brutal. The fight choreography is more realistic, combining different martial arts styles. Batman's gadgets are minimal. He uses his grappling device to go up, He's got the wingsuit, he glides a little bit and then hits the ground, and somehow he's not really that injured. The style of fighting where Batman takes out a mob of enemies feels like the Batman Arkham games. In the detective scenes later, Selina can see characters' names using Bruce's tech, again making it feel like a video game. It follows the progression of discovering new locations, meeting important characters, and searching for clues, with action and stealth scenes sprinkled throughout. The Batman takes part in a juggling act with all these various elements. It takes its time to establish the characters, their motives, and obstacles while also maintaining suspense and excitement. The screen time is mostly spent in character and world building, which all revolves around a crime-ridden city going from Halloween night into election season. Director Matt Reeves took the time to go back and read through some Batman comics in preparation for the film. His approach to the film was very passionate, and he also looks a lot like Jim Gordon. The Gotham of the Batman strikes a nice balance between the gritty realism of Nolan's world and the cartoonish fantasy of Tim Burton's films. The Batman is loosely based on the Long Halloween comic, but also uses Batman Year 2 for inspiration as well. I've never read these because I had to choose between time for reading comics and time for playing video games. And I chose video games, but that doesn't make me an incel. I've had enough of this slander, it's a defamation of character. The camera work is exceptional, in one of the first shots of the movie, we're looking down on a politician and the majority of the screen is obscured. In many of the shots, either the foreground or the background will be deeply out of focus. One example is a scene where Bruce Wayne is visiting Falcone without his disguise. Or is Bruce Wayne his disguise? It's a question the movie grapples with. There's a kill scene in the movie where the field of vision is heavily obscured. The Batman works well as a horror slasher flick, though it's more about what you don't see than what you do. Suspense is built effectively. We know a character is being watched, but they don't. The film is more about espionage and surveillance as Batman uses his intellect to solve a mystery. The color choices are muted. This is as far as you can get from the usual bright, candy-coated superhero genre films. The musical score is quite minimal. It's based on the repetition of just a few notes with discordant strings and a plodding bass. The combination of music and voiceover in the opening builds into a magnificent crescendo. The use of Nirvana's Something in the Way is a perfect soundtrack choice to bookend the film with. Its contemplative lyrics and brooding melody evoke Bruce's childhood trauma and isolation. The chords of the song are matched to the images on screen with precise editing. There's a love theme given to the character of Catwoman. The first time that it plays, Batman is forcing her into submission, but he's also trying to protect her from being caught. There's a dark, erotic undertone at play. Batman up to this point of the film has been detached and methodical. We sense his humanity in his attraction to Selina. There are two different scenes where Bruce sees himself in a young man and mourns the loss of his childhood. Alfred picks up on this and understands why Bruce was triggered. It's all handled with enough subtlety. There was volume technology used for this idealized romantic background of Gotham. The film began production before the pandemic and had to halt for six months. Using digital technology, the filmmakers were able to craft some natural-looking visuals. 
The car chase scene in the rain on a traffic-filled street is shot and edited really well. They staged a car against LED screens and it looks real. It's a great accomplishment of blending practical and CG. There was a shot like this one from the perspective of a crashed car in Tenet as well. Another film that used practical effects when it could. Thankfully, when the Batman does include big set pieces, it doesn't overuse its CG. The Gotham City Hall funeral scene was shot on a huge set in an airplane hangar. The director just yells, boom, here comes the car, and then they drive a car through the set. Batman is a private investigator, a Philip Marlowe style character. He's not a cop or a criminal, but an independent entity. He's portrayed as a flawed character here, obsessed with vengeance and stalking the night for criminals. Even if he's going after the morally reprehensible, his actions are outside of the law, making him just a little unhinged. Jim Gordon understands that Batman is different from a man like Riddler, but not all of society can see this. Riddler builds a following through his message of no more lies. Certainly a better political slogan than evil dies tonight. This is not a Batman origin story, but it is a younger version of Batman, where he's more conflicted about the kind of man he wants to be. Some people have referred to this Batman as emo Batman, but I have no problem with Batman being a brooding character. Batman can be self-righteous. He's a self-appointed protector of Gotham, but not an executioner because that would make him no better than the criminals. Yet there have been situations in past Batman movies where he definitely killed people. Before the Batman released, there was online discussion about Robert Pattinson's refusal to bulk up for this movie. It turns out, we don't see Batman a lot with his shirt off, so it doesn't really matter. There's one scene where he takes his shirt off and he still looks pretty fit. That controversy sure was pointless rage baiting. Excessive voiceover can ruin a movie, but Pattinson's voiceover only bookends the film. His portrayal reminds me of a less deranged Travis Bickle. Catwoman is a femme fatale, an independent party like Batman, neither completely on the side of the law or on the side of crime. Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz have good chemistry together. In fact, they do something called a chemistry read with actors, so it's scientifically proven. Yet the scene with the most emotional impact is one between Bruce and his mentor Alfred. It's the one where Bruce opens up and talks about his feelings. Batman is also a voyeur as he tracks and trails people in search of Riddler. He uses cameras he attaches to his eyeballs to record everything he sees. He puts these cameras on Catwoman. He needs to see through her eyes so that we, the audience, can see through her eyes. She explains to Batman that if she looks back at her target, she'll attract his attention. The difference of seeing through a woman's eyes. Batman also has some kind of foot fetish going on because he's always looking at Catwoman's boots really intensely. Paul Dano is great as the Riddler, even though we don't see his face until over two hours into the movie. His Riddler is a social media psycho, an anonymous loner building an online following through fear and hatred. He releases a YouTube drama-style hit piece on Thomas Wayne, dragging the Wayne family name through the mud. Riddler is an orphan like Bruce. He resents Bruce because he grew up without money as a drophead, drops being a style of opiate based on the appearance of the dropheads hanging out at the club. Riddler is obsessed with justice in the same way that Batman is obsessed with vengeance. The film draws parallels between the Riddler and Batman. He's a mirror character, a shadow of Bruce who has succumbed to mental illness. The film opens with a horror-style, heavy-breathing POV shot from Riddler's perspective. Ava Maria plays during these scenes, and using classical music to characterize a villain does seem a little cliche, but it's still effective. When the film uses the old trope of Batman disappearing while Jim Gordon is still talking, it's not just done to check a box, it's for a suspenseful emotional scene. A crosscut of two different time periods, only it's built as a trick to make the audience think that it's all happening at once. It feels like classic filmmaking, more along the lines of Alfred Hitchcock than Zack Snyder. And I don't hate Zack Snyder's films as much as other people do, but that's only because I'm a DC stan. Just look at me. I've become the thing I hate. The Batman takes place during an election, and there's a political subtext when it comes to the manipulation of the masses through social media, but it doesn't really have an overt political message. All anyone cares about in this place are these white privileged assholes. The irony of the white privilege line is that she's accusing Bruce Wayne of having white privilege while also falling in love with Batman. It makes sense for the character and the themes of the film, it being a story about crime, government, and law enforcement. I have no problem with the white privilege reference in the Batman, and I do have final authority on this, being me myself the clown prince of white privilege. You kind of have to have white privilege to have the time for all of this. Whatever all of this is. 
For most of the film, Riddler is going after people he deems to be corrupt, Light Yagami style. He's Alex Jones writing the 4chan incel manifesto. He's also a big Batman fan, by the way. Yet he hates Bruce Wayne. Riddler starts off his live streams by saying, Hey guys! And in the chat, somebody is saying, Don't forget your cling wrap! Riddler goes full on God Complex, yelling boom silently over the sound of explosions, prophesizing over the great flood he's created. He becomes a little less interesting with this final act plan. He's really just going full Joker mode, and that's kind of my thing. At least Riddler isn't a James Bond villain revealing his entire plan, but he does have a secret map of it that Batman conveniently discovers right as said plan is taking place. One of Riddler's follower clones repeats Batman's line of I am vengeance, so Batman realizes he's been too wrathful and needs to melodramatically baptize himself in a sacrificial scene where he cuts a wire falling into the water below and saves all the people trapped by the flood. His first greatly heroic act, a little bigger than his usual routine, beating up gang members on a train platform. The Batman could have easily ended after this scene with Pattinson's voiceover, but instead there's a long goodbye with Catwoman where we follow them down the street on their motorcycles until they finally part ways. Then there's a setup for Joker, which was completely unnecessary. There's nothing worse than trying to cram Joker into something that doesn't need him. They might have been able to say more with less by cutting this down a little. I'm not gonna hate on this epic three-hour cut of the movie, but its length might be considered a flaw. In the interest of being slightly contrarian, I refuse to give this film a perfect score, but I can't deny that it's a really well-rounded Batman film to add to the pile of Batman films in which I'm slowly suffocating. The Batman is a 9 out of 10, and the only thing left to say is, up yours, woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. Ladies and gentlemen, the clown show has been put on hiatus for retooling. Oh, I'm canceled? You can't cancel me. I'm Jerko the Clown.